Yeah, I guess I'll, uh, I'll get started. Um, I'm Jordan, I'm one of the PGY2s. I'm going to talk about abdominal trauma. So I have to um, just apologize ahead of time. I didn't know that this was an hour slot in terms of the presentation So um, until this morning. So this is not going to run an hour. It's probably only going to be uh, you know, the usual half hour or 35 minutes um, if I stretch it. But uh, So anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll just go through and, and um, you know, maybe finish up a bit early today. But so abdominal and, and abdominal trauma, liver and spleen. So uh, outline today is to to start with a bit of liver anatomy, just a really quick review. Talk about uh, prevalence and mortality of liver trauma. I'm going to look at the uh, CT features of liver trauma, so the, it's the the major categories, and look at some literature cases and some local cases, and. Then we're going to go over the guidelines of uh, grading system, the liver injury, and that's through the AAST. And then I just want to talk briefly about uh, splenic trauma. Uh, not, not as long, but uh, also look at the AAST criteria for spleen trauma and, and just look at a couple of local cases. So classically, the liver is, um, the, the anatomy is based on the external appearance and there's four lobes, and we all know that, the right and the left, and the caudate and quadrate. Um, and the caudate and quadrate lobes are much smaller, and they're seen, um, they're best seen on the inferior, uh, here's caudate and here's quadrate, best seen on the inferior surface of the liver. And that's kind of the classical picture of the anatomy. But we, in radiology and the surgeons as well, deal more with the functional liver anatomy, and it makes more sense. This is the Quinard classification, we all know this. I Again, good to, uh, good to review. So the liver is divided into eight functional segments, and each segment um, has its own vascular inflow, its outflow, and biliary drainage. So in the center of each of these eight segments, you have a branch of the portal vein, the hepatic artery, and the bile duct. And so the middle hepatic vein, which comes down the middle, divides the uh, liver into the right and left uh, functional segments, and then the right divides this right lobe into um, the anterior, which would be 8 and 5, and the posterior, which would be 7 and 6, and then the left hepatic vein divides it into um, the medial, which would be the 4, A and B, and then the lateral would be 2 and 3. And then the portal vein comes in and divides it into the superior or upper and the inferior or lower segments. So liver trauma, just a few points here about it. It's so the liver is the second most frequently injured abdominal organ. And spleen is number one. Uh, the right lobe of the liver is the most commonly injured lobe, and the left lobe injuries are often associated with duodenal and pancreatic injuries, so something to watch for if you do have a left lobe injury. The prevalence of liver injury in patients who have sustained blunt trauma has been reported to be about 1% to 8%. Now, that was based on... Um, an article from Radiographics. There was different articles I read, and all of them gave different prevalences. One article actually gave up to 25% of patients who had been uh, operated on had liver injury. Um, but most of the p papers were between 5 and 10% or somewhere, you know, between the one. That's the one I went with. The mortality rate is not insignificant. Um, most quotes I read were, you know, 5 to 10% again. Uh, so 4.1 to 11 percent, so not, not an insignificant injury. Research over the past decade or, show, or so, or even a, a bit longer, shows that most liver injuries have stopped bleeding by the time of surgery, upwards to 70 percent. And transfusion requirements and intra-abdominal complications are higher in liver patients that undergo laparotomy. And so there's been really this paradigm shift, as we all know, over the past decade, or even more now, um, right, basically from the mid-90s onward, I think, is to manage these patients uh, non-operatively. And that's now the preferred strategy in hemodynamically stable patients. So the use of CT in the diagnosis and management of blunt liver trauma is mainly responsible for this change, because then we can see the injuries and help the surgeons decide how significant they are. So it helps to triage the patients with more severe injuries who may require 
operotomy. So the major CT features of blunt liver trauma include lacerations, hematoma, like subcapular hem subcapsular hematoma and parenchymal. Intrafranchal hematoma is also referred to as contusion. Um, and then you have active hemorrhage and major juxtahepatic venous injuries. So lacerations are the most common type of parenchymal injury. Uh, injury to the liver. It's something, you know, we uh, see fairly frequently when there's been uh, blunt trauma. They appear as linear or branching low attenuation areas uh, at contrast enhanced CT, and I'll show some examples. Um, and just keep in mind, lacerations that extend to the posterior superior region of segment 7 or the bare area are associated with retroperitoneal hematomas because this area is in direct contact with rather than seeing intraperitoneal hematoma, you would see that. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And these injuries are also associated with right adrenal gland injuries or renal injuries. So lacerations that extend to the pore hepatis uh, com are commonly associated with bile duct injuries as well. So this is an example uh, just from the literature. So these are lacerations. You can see they're linear, um, low in attenuation. Uh, this one is um, a sort of complex. It's got more than one coming together around the port of hepatis on the right. This is a local case um, of some uh, lacerations. So these are through segments six and seven. You can see some of this is linear. There is some kind of um, a bit of uh, hematoma here as well, but uh, the, the linear aspects are, are lacerations. Oh, the other thing to point out here is the adrenal hematoma. You see around the uh, right adrenal gland. You also have some hematoma there. Another local case. This, this one was a bit tougher to window. It actually looks a bit better up there, I think. Um, but this is a patient who, who jumped off a building and sustained laceration and hematoma around the porta hepatis. So at first glance, you know, you could go by this thinking, you know, this is the porta hepatis coming in and your bile ducts and so on, but there's too much hypoattenuating linear material here. It's just, it's, it's just too dark and there's too much of it. So it is uh, that there are lacerations around the porta hepatis in segment eight. Hematoma, so that's laceration. Hematoma is the next category. Subcapsular hematoma is an elliptical collection of uh, blood between the liver capsule and the enhancing liver parenchyma. And it can be differentiated from free intraperitoneal blood in the perihepatic space in that it, it causes indentation or, or flattening of the underlying liver margin. So it puts pressure on the underlying uh, liver parenchyma, whereas intraperitoneal blood just kind of follows the contour and doesn't really put pressure on it. Intraparenchymal hematomas are the other kind, and these are also known as contusions, and they're characterized by uh, low attenuation areas with poorly defined irregular margins in the, in the parenchyma on enhanced CT, but be careful about unenhanced CT. Um, usually, I know we, we do enhance for, for trauma, but if, you, if, if it is something you're doing enhanced for, then they look hyper attenuated. So here's uh, different examples. So here's subcapsular, again, from the literature. But, uh, so subcapsular hematomas have that elliptical shape, and they're um, compressing the liver parenchyma. So the long arrows on this uh, diagram on the left are showing subcapsular, but there's also intraparenchymal hematomas here. So low in attenuation. And this is uh, just a chronal shot of a subcapsular. And so here we have uh, enhanced picture on the left and an unenhanced picture uh, on the right. So in this enhanced picture, you can see that the um, you have parenchymal hematoma here, which is hypoattenuating, and here on the right, the hematoma is actually hyperattenuating to the background unenhanced liver uh, with kind of a halo of uh, hypoattenuation surrounding it. Local case, this patient fell while skiing, sustained a large liver um, subcapsular hematoma. Uh, so you can see it's compressing, it's compressing the underlying liver parenchyma. There's also a, a small hypodensity here. There's an arrow here. I don't know if you can see it that well. It's uh, right along the middle hepatic vein, and that was a laceration. It's called either a small laceration or, or an intraparenchymal contusion. Um, 
chemoperitoneum, and there's also, again, uh, something to watch for, again, a reminder is that contusion of the right adrenal gland. You can see there's just too much uh, material here. Another local case, this is a patient that fell off a dump truck. Um, so this is a complex hematoma through segments six and seven. So you can see here, these are more linear. So this is some laceration. And then on the coronal, it looks kind of um, mass-like with irregular sort of margins and not as linear. So that's um, hematoma as well. And again, you have hemorrhage uh, superior to the kidney there in the right adrenal gland. Oh, oh, okay. uh, so another local case this is a patient that fell off a bicycle. Um, so a significant injury for that mechanism, but uh, again, you have um, just uh, on the point we have um, subcapsular hematoma and then intraparenchymal hematoma as well. Active hemorrhage, um, you can see active hemorrhage at contrast enhanced CT as focal high attenuation areas that represent a collection of extravasated contrast material secondary to arterial bleeding. And this can be differentiated from clotted blood by measuring CT attenuation. And there's a study in 2002 where Wilman looked at this. And he basically showed that if you have active arterial extravasation of contrast, it's going to be higher um, in attenuation than your, than your clotted blood. So around Hounsfield units of 150 or so for uh, extravasated contrast versus if it's a cl if blood that's clotted off, it's going to be, be less. It's going to be around 50. So just something to keep in mind. So hemorrhage um, can manifest as extravasation of contrast either locally into the parenchymal hematoma or into the peritoneal space as what's described as a jet. Um, it's important to recognize active hemorrhage, obviously, because um, it's a strong predictor of failure of non-surgical management. So it's just an indicator of a serious injury and something we have to recognize promptly. Um, so that's when, you know, you should be calling surgery or calling interventional, um, you know, to, to, uh, for further management. And so angiographic embolization um, has been shown to be safe and effective in the management of patients with arterial hemorrhage. And so interventional uh, has become critical in the management of these patients. So um, again, something to, to keep in mind if you see one of these on call. So this, these are obvious examples here of um, extravasation of contrast material. This obviously is a significant injury with a lot of um, contrast extravasating into the hematoma. This one a little more subtle, the one on the right. Um, you know, you, you, you'd have to scroll up and down to make sure you're not going through in a, a, um, a vessel there that just has contrast in it. But it's not, it's not, the shape isn't right, and it's not uh, in the right location, and it's in the middle of the hematoma. So um, it, it would fit with uh, extravasation and contrast as well. So this, uh, this is another case. I don't know how well these are showing up, but this is from the literature. I tried to, to make it show up as best I could. but. Again, this is just showing arterial hemorrhage into the hematoma and into the perihepatic space. And then on your celiac arteriogram, it's shown to be from the right uh, hepatic artery. And then you can maybe see some uh, microcoils here showing embolization and stoppage of bleeding. This is a local case. This is not a blunt trauma, so just uh, a little different, something to keep in mind. It's not blunt, but uh, this was a, an interesting one because it's a patient who uh, was stabbed, so I just wanted to show it because it highlights um, a bit of different injuries that can happen. So what happened here was this patient had a laceration through the right kidney and up into the liver into segments six and seven. And this is in the arterial phase, and you can see the different, um, the different enhancement within the liver, and you can see this kind of um, intrusion of the right hepatic artery here, and what that ended up being was a pseudoaneurysm. And there was arterial portal fistula uh, to the portal venous branches of the posterior um, right lobe, and that's why this is showing up to look in, look like it's in portal venous phase, whereas the rest of the liver is showing up in the arterial phase as it should. Interesting one with the fistula. And then this is um, 
These are images from uh, the embolization. So this, this is the diagnostic angiogram, and this is the pseudoaneurysm here. Um, and you can see that the portal vein distal to this, the portal venous system is uh, showing up because of the fistula. And then this is post-embolization. Uh, so embolization of the hepatic artery, the fistula, and the pseudoaneurysm is stopping the flow into the portal system. So really, inter really interesting detail. So major venous injury, um, this is something you have to suspect if uh, you see hematoma that extends into the area of the vein, obviously, kind of a intuitive statement. Um, but again, this is one that has to keep us to think, okay, this is a major injury and I have to speak to someone about this. There was a study done by Paletti in 2000 where he showed that liver-related surgery was six and a half times more frequently required when laceration extends into one of the one or more of the major hepatic veins. So again, it's obvious if one of the hepatic veins is um, injured, then it's, you know, this patient's more likely, very more likely to need surgery. Um, and hepatic venous injury was also, he found, associated with, or three and a half times more frequently associated with hepatic arterial bleeding. So if you do have venous injury, you're more likely to have arterial bleeding. The mechanism is a lot more significant. So something to keep in mind. And this is uh, an example from the literature just showing laceration extending to the IVC and the cutoff of the right uh, hepatic venous drainage. So I didn't actually have a of major venous injury. But, um, so the CT-based injury grading system I just wanted to touch on. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, it is important for us to know. The thing I read about it, which is interesting, is that the importance of it in the you know, uh, application of this grading system is kind of debated now in the literature. Some papers say it's, you know, it's, it's good, it can lead you in one way or the other to direct the surgeon, whereas other papers more recently say you know, it's, not, it's not always accurate at the time of surgery. Um, so it's a bit up for debate, this one and the spleen both. But the most widely used grading system is still the one established by the AAST, or the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma. And this organization uh, was formed in 1987, and they base their findings on laparotomy, autopsy, and CT. And so this was, so the, so the lead author is Ernest Moore, and again, first put in place in 1989. I hope that shows up okay. And then uh, there was a revision criteria put forth in 1994. Just a reference. And so these are the grades. So for liver, you have one through six. And it kind of makes intuitive sense as you go up through the, uh, as you go up through the, the grades and you know, the injury gets more severe. So starting with grade one, I'll just kind of briefly outline and then show some examples. So grade one, uh, subcapsular less than 10% of your surface area or laceration less than 1% of parenchymal depth. So not using length, using parenchymal depth. Um, hematoma. For grade two, a subcapsular 10 to 50, or a laceration, or an intraparenchymal less than 10 centimeters in diameter, or a laceration between one and three centimeters. Grade three is when you get a subcapsular greater than 50% or expanding. And for intraparenchymal, it's uh, greater than 10 centimeters or expanding. And a laceration greater than three centimeters. When you get into grade four, you're having uh, parenchymal disruption involving 25 to 75 percent of the hepatic lobe or one to three segments. And grade five is greater than 75 percent uh, of the hepatic lobe involved or more than three segments within a single lobe or major vascular injuries such as IVC or uh, vena cava, or sorry, or um, major hepatic veins. <coughs> and six is hepatic avulsion complete. So again, grade one, so just um, small lacerations uh, are considered grade one, or a small heat, uh, subcapsular hematoma. Grade two, uh, a subcapsular hematoma thought to be um, 10 to 50 percent of the surface area. That's what was estimated. Laceration gets a little deeper into the parenchyma, one to three centimeters. Grade three. Um, so, again, on the left here, you have a subcapsular 
uh, hematoma with extravasation of contrast material into the subcapsular hematoma. On the right here, a laceration greater than three centimeters parenchymal depth. This one, I think, looks like it's approaching the port of path. Grade four would be your ruptured intraparenchymal hematoma with active intraparenchymal uh, into the sorry into the hematoma, and so that's what this uh, diagram is showing. And over on the right, there's um, multiple hepatic lacerations resulting in disruption of about 50 percent, so between 25 and 75 percent uh, disruption of the hepatic lobe. So grade five um, is when you're really getting into serious injury. So you have parenchymal disruption of more than 75% of the hepatic lobe here. And, all, and the other would be major vascular injury. So this uh, showing deep laceration into the um, left hepatic vein. Also just wanted to touch briefly on splenic trauma. Um, so the spleen uh, is the most commonly injured, injured uh, intraperitoneal organ in blunt trauma. Uh, it's the largest lymphatic organ. It manufactures lymphocytes, it filters blood, and it acts as a blood reservoir. And in terms of um, a bit of anatomy, the, the spleen has a fibroelastic capsule that's surrounded by uh, peritoneum, except at the hilum. And it's made up of pulp. So. Uh, Back to a bit of histology. So the pulp is the substance of the spleen. There's white pulp and red pulp. And the white pulp is the lymphoid uh, nodules. And the red pulp is the sinusoidal spaces containing blood. So in, in a similar fashion to the liver, um, and you'll see that these are kind of recurring themes. That's why I lumped these two together. Non-operative management is now the standard of care in stable patients who have had um, splenic laceration as well. And Arteriography and transcatheter embolization are an important part of the management now. And contrast CT is excellent at identifying major splenic injury. It, it pretty well identifies all of them. So again, this seems to be very similar to what we were seeing with the liver um, in terms of classification of injury. You have lacerations, which are linear branching hypodensities. You can have hematomas, which again are subcapsular compressing the parenchyma, they're crescentic, or you can have intraparenchymal, um, poorly circumscribed within the, within the spleen, and it's a hypodense region. You can have infarction, which are wedge-shaped hypodensities with the base of the wedge towards the periphery, and vascular injuries such as pseudoaneurysm or AV fistula or active extravasation of contrast as well. And so this uh, is the grading system for the spleen. So quite similar to the, to the grading system for the liver. So I won't go through all of these, but um, you know, really what changes is the size criteria. So um, for hematoma, the, uh, the size you can see it's like a five centimeter rather than the 10 centimeter in diameter and so on. Um, but again, you know, here you have grade one through five. Um, grade one being, you know, an, a small hematoma or a small laceration. When you get up to grade four, um, it's laceration involving um, hilar vessels, producing major devascularization. So if you see vessel involvement, you know you're already into uh, grade four. And grade five is what's called a completely shattered spleen. Same authors. So this is, uh, these are all local cases. This is, again, uh, just an, an MVA showing multiple lacerations to the spleen. You can see the multiple lacerations. There's major hypodensities. Again, another um, MVC here, a subcapsular hematoma. This um, will be classified as grade 3 because it takes up more than 50 percent. So you can see it compressing the parenchyma. This is a ruptured subcapsular hematoma, so it's a bit tough to tell, but you can, there is uh, ext some extravasation of contrast here um, and into the um, subcapsular hematoma. There was no injury to the um, hilar vessels, so it was still a grade three. This one was um, 
fairly significant injury as well, multiple complex lacerations and hematomas. This patient had fell, history said, fallen onto jagged rocks. I don't know, you know, from what height or, or anything. So there's an active extravasation of contrast. You can see that, the, you know, this obviously has a vessel. It's not following any vascular pattern. It's just kind of extravasating there in multiple areas. Um, and so this is grade three because, uh, again, the, the hilar vessels weren't um, disrupted in this case. That was all I had. <laughs> uh, I know that wasn't an hour. But um, again, I didn't find out that Diana wasn't here until this morning. <laughs> so, so thanks to Dr. Butt and uh, Dr. Pasui for for helping me uh, grab some cases and go through them. Some questions. Everybody knows this. Some more cases, but I was like, you know, I'm going to go, going to go over time if I have questions. Um, I think I like to play the test. I should start this. And then you pick the topic in which uh, you 